guys, I'm LT. And I'm Dan. And welcome to BHK Outdoors, your beacon for all things outdoors. So grab a cup of coffee. Or chaga. And for the next 30 minutes, let's get out there. Okay, today's program is brought to you by Self-Reliance Illustrated, teaching our youth and passing on the tribal knowledge. You can check out Self-Reliance Illustrated at selfreliancillustrated.com. They have both print copies and e-copies available. It's a bi-monthly magazine. A lot of information just on the self-reliance skills out there. Well, we'd like to thank you folks for tuning in this morning. And we have a special guest with us today. His name is Hal Harper. And Hal is the East Central District Manager of the Ohio State Parks. So we have a, a great program in in uh, store for you today and we would like to welcome our guest hello how hello how are you today we're pretty good yep just uh having a great day here in ohio good so how if so i'm interested in listening to you guys oh well well thank you very much thank you for coming on as a guest we really appreciate it you're one of our first guests and and we thank you for that um how can you what can you tell us about yourself well i can tell you i've been with uh ohio state parks for nearly 27 years uh, I started in the, the golf end of Ohio State Parks at uh, Salt Fork as a golf course superintendent, and uh, from there kind of progressed up through the ranks until I became the district manager just uh, about six months ago. Wow, that's pretty cool. Can you tell us uh, what parks are near here to us in Cambridge? Well, in, in what we call the East Central District, uh, if we start to the west, uh, we've got Black Hand Gorge, Nature Preserve near Newark, uh, Buckeye Lake, near the village of Buckeye Lake, obviously. Uh, Dillon, which is near Zanesville. That's Kingham River Parkway, which follows the river basically from Dresden all the way to Marietta. It's a rather unique system in that uh, there's a series of locks that goes down through there that uh, were developed in the mid-1800s, and several of those are still operational today. <clears throat> We've got Blue Rock near Cup. Excuse me, <clears throat> Blue Rock near Duncan Falls, uh, Salt Fork, which is near Cambridge, mm -hmm. Wolf Run in Caldwell, and Bar Camp, which is the Barnesville, St. Clairsville area. That sounds like a, a lot of stuff going on relatively close to the Cambridge area then. Yeah, so that Muskegon uh, River... Yeah, it's all uh, relatively close. Yeah, that Muskegon River Parkway one, is that something that people can drive a boat down through there? Or? Yes, in fact, it was uh, it was initially developed uh, for river travel, like I said, back in the in the mid-1800s. And uh, as a result, you can still travel most of that river. Uh, you have to lock up and down in several places, but uh, the locks are the originals from the mid-1800s, and uh, it's the oldest working lock system in the United States. Wow, I didn't know that. That would be pretty cool. That sounds like that's one of the float trips or something. We I think we're going to have to do a little float trip on that one ourselves, yeah. I, I noticed you had one on here called uh, Black Hand Gorge Na Nature Preserve. Well, uh, maybe yes. uh, the, the word nature preserve, I, I guess, is that different than a state park? It is different uh, than a state park, and, and the nature preserves, uh, it was previously called DNAP, or Department of Natural Areas and Preserves, uh, and parks just merged about a year ago, okay. and so we're kind of working together with them. The nature preserves typically, you don't get the park atmosphere in that they're, they tend to be less developed and no camping and that type of thing to speak of. Mm. So they're there for people to get tours uh, just to see some different natural areas that uh, are throughout the state. Uh, Black Hand Gorge is a little bit different. It's actually the gorge that runs through, or the Licking River runs through the gorge. Okay. And it uh, runs through a big stand, sandstone outcropping there. But there's a lot of history in that particular area, and I think it's it's almost more of a historical site than it is a nature preserve. It... Uh, there's uh, an eight-mile bike trail that goes through it. It's paved, so you can walk it or you can ride it. Uh, of course, you're, you're looking at 16 miles if you go the total thing out and back because it doesn't loop. But uh, oh, wow, that's it, it's a pretty interesting place. Bike trail, Mikey. Did you hear that? Yeah, our producer Mike Kaniger, he's a, an avid biker, so now it gives him another 
place to get out and check out then too. That sounds pretty cool. I like the idea that this is historical as well. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a history nut, so I like, you know, I consider myself a mountain man, so I got to check yes, some of these do. places out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. how how can some, how can somebody find out um, mm. information about these particular areas? Uh, the easiest thing to do, obviously, is if you can uh, go online. You've got access to a computer. Mm-hmm. Just check it out at uh, OhioStateParks.org, okay. uh, or you could contract contact Ohio State Parks. Okay, uh, we have an eight hundred number that uh, is eight hundred. Five five seven eight four one zero, and you could call there, and, and they could provide you some information. Mm. Or if you just stop at one of the local parks, we have most of the pamphlets for the other parks in the state. Okay, uh, you know one of the things that I've always wondered about. Um, I, I know we have Wayne National Forest down here, and I'm familiar with Salt Fork State Park. What is the difference between a state park and a national forest? Well, the obvious thing is that. Uh, The state park is uh, operated by the state of Ohio as opposed to uh, the national forest being part of the federal system. Okay. But also you'll find in state parks, they're typically more developed for recreation and that they'll have uh, full full, uh, hookup campsites and that type of thing, whereas in the national forest, you're probably just going to have primitive campgrounds. Uh, They don't tend to develop and have the the restrooms and shower houses and that type of thing in, in the national forest. They were developed more for conservation, whereas the state parks were more for recreation. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, can you tell me, is Salt Fork State Park, is that the largest state park that we have in Ohio? That is the largest state park in Ohio. Uh, it's just over 20,000 acres. Wow. And, uh, about 12,000 of that is set aside for uh, hunting. Uh, that, uh, and, of course, deer, white-tailed deer in this area and turkey are, are very popular uh, hunting. And, uh, of course, you've got uh, the 2,000-acre lake that uh, all kinds of water recreation can go in there. Well, I didn't realize that lake was that big. No, me neither. Can can yeah. you hunt in all of the state parks, or is that just open to a few? Uh, most state parks are open for hunting at some point. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of on a park by park basis as to what hunting is allowed in that particular area and what particular time. Some of them have no hunting whatsoever. And with 77 state parks, like I say, there's a there's a huge variety of what the rules are for those particular areas. So yeah. the the best thing to do was kind of get a hold of each one individually then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know that's pretty awesome. I don't know how, how people in Ohio feel about the state park system, but um, having lived in Texas before, I can tell you that there's way more public hunting ground in Ohio than there was in the entire state of Texas. Right. Actually, Dan, I think you've even hunted Stalt Fork many times, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I've been out there. I, I like to stomp around out there. Yeah. So that's that's a, a really nice place. I didn't realize it was the largest state park, and I didn't realize how big that lake was, so I'm going to have to give that a, well, a we'll lot of extra Well, when we get our canoes chance. this year, we'll go yes, paddle around. Yes, absolutely. It. We're going to get some water time in. Well, well, how? what kind of programs do you have coming up? Well, we've got uh, all kinds of programs that uh, that we do throughout the year. Uh, Labor Day or Memorial Day through Labor Day, uh, most of the parks have a naturalist program. Uh, at Salt Fork, it is limited to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, but uh, if you stop in, it's near the beach, or the, is where our nature center is, and they do all kinds of programs throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the most popular one we have is uh, on Sunday evenings, we do what they call a salt fork safari at the golf course. Uh, the golf course obviously known for having a huge uh, white-tailed deer population, as well as some other things. And they, we allow about 15 carts to go out, and the naturalist goes around with them and points out different things that, uh, that they may not normally know about. Uh, the golf course setting is, is conducive to a lot of wildlife being out grazing and flying around or whatever. So okay. people get to see some things 
pretty close hand that they don't normally get to see. Is there a charge on on that kind of uh, an event? That particular one, there is a charge on. Okay. Uh, I believe it's six dollars a head. Still, it sounds like a, a an interesting, nice Sunday evening, for sure. Yeah, and and then they also do other things <clears throat> like uh, creek walks and, and walk through the creeks and, right. and look at uh, habitat and see if they can find some salamanders or whatever else uh, they do. Uh, and I'll walk every now and then. They don't do it every week, but. Uh, it's kind of interesting to go out and, and call to the owls and have them answer. And, uh, occasionally you actually see one, but they're, they're pretty, pretty hard to pick out at night. Wow. Hey, uh, just taking a minute here, guys, I'd like to remind you that today's show is brought to you by Self-Reliance Illustrated. You can check out the magazine at selfrelianceillustrated.com. It is available in print and e-copies. Um, also, there is a Facebook page, Self-Reliance Illustrated. Go there, and now they just have a brand new forum up where you can get on there and you can talk to people that are like-minded in self-reliance, hunting, fishing, camping, all those things. Get on there. There's people around the world on the forums that are more than willing to help you with some of the questions that you might have, be it camping or hunting. So check them out at Self-Reliance Illustrated and at selfrelianceillustrated.com. So we thank them for sponsoring today's program. Uh, how getting back to the uh, programs that you were offering? Do you do you have a lot of stuff going on for the kids? Uh, we do have a lot of stuff going on for kids. Uh, there's a variety of things that uh, that the naturalists do with them, uh, whether it's making uh, clay impressions of uh, wildlife tracks or just uh, some coloring programs. Uh, we occasionally do a fishing program with them, mm-hmm. things of that nature that. Uh, we try to get them interested in nature and what's going on around them. Well, that's good. I really think that's really important, uh, giving back to the youth. Um, what can you tell us, Hal, about uh, camping in the state parks? Well, again, uh, with the, with a huge number of state parks we've got, you've got a, a wide variety of camping opportunities. At Salt Fork alone, uh, we've got uh, 212 what we call Class A campsites, which uh, include 50 amp electric. Uh, Included in that are uh, 20 campsites with full hookups, water, sewer, and electric. And then uh, we just opened last year our primitive camp, which is designed just for those folks that want to get away and and do some tent camping. So we've got that offered for them, as well as a group camp where... uh, a Boy Scout group or a church group or the Girl Scouts or whomever, if they want to come in as a group, they can come in and uh, reserve that campground and, and stay there for for the night or for the weekend or whatever they like to do. Hmm. In most cases, we uh, fix them up with some kind of a service project so that there's actually no charge for them to stay, and they'll do the, the service project for us, which usually involves some litter cleanup or some things like that that... Uh, that uh, younger folks can do without uh, taxing them too much, but uh, gives them an opportunity to give back a little bit for a free night's camping. It yeah. sounds like it. Yeah, there there shouldn't be any reason that, like you said, the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, or even any of the church groups, there's no excuse to not go camping. If you guys are offering it up, geez, here's free of charge. Just help us out a little bit with the litter cleanup or, or trail cleanup or something like that. Wow. I mean, that's, that's in my opinion, really giving back to the public. Nice job, guys. Yeah, that's a good one right Thank there. Um, can you camp in all of the state parks or just a, some of them? Uh, there are a few state parks that are day use only. Uh, they're kind of scattered around the state. Most most of the camps or most of the parks do have a campground of some sort in them. Well, that's pretty cool. Where would somebody go again to the state parks info to get info on each one of the individual camps? That is at www.ohiostateparks.org. That sounds that's great. Cool. And that includes our campground reservation system also. Okay, so, so you can go on there and uh, pick a park, pick out your campsite, uh, and reserve it for whenever you might want to come and stay. Hmm. Uh, at the same site, uh, you can reserve picnic shelters at the different state parks also. 
Oh, I like that. So you can have some get togethers there. You, you had mentioned earlier primitive and, and like class A or, or modern type camping in the primitive areas. When, when you say primitive, does that kind of put you away from the bathrooms as well? Or how, how's all that work? Uh, yes, it puts you away from the bathrooms. Uh, the Ohio Department of Health requires that uh, there be water and uh, some type of bathroom facility within a certain distance of a campsite. But uh, in the primitive areas, we tend to have just uh, fit latrines rather than the full flush restrooms okay. and showers and and all those amenities instead of uh, just a pit latrine. So when you get into the primitive areas, that's what uh, that's what you're looking at. So you still at least have a, a bathroom rel- kind of accessible to you and running water of sorts, even in the primitive. Yes. Well, that's nice yes. because that's, that way it gives an opportunity for a family if they want to do some tent camping or whatever and they don't, don't have a, a, a camper trailer, here's the opportunity. They're still not like way, way out but give them a taste of getting out as a family and doing a little bit of primitive camping. I like that. Yeah, so is there fires permitted in those areas, Hal? Uh, yes, there are fires permitted. Uh, we only permit fires at the campsites, uh, and each campsite comes with a fire ring, so you know exactly where to build your fire, and uh, it keeps you contained, and, and we're very cautious about that, obviously, but uh, we do allow the fires in the, in the parks. Now, one of the things that I've noticed, um, and I think I've seen it, maybe not in Ohio, but in other states, what's kind of regulations on the firewood? Um, I, I think some places don't allow you to bring it from wherever you live, right? Well, we had, in Ohio, we had gone through that with the uh, Emerald Ash Borer, okay. and uh, we had been under quarantine in certain counties. Uh, the ash borer has become so prevalent that we've kind of given up on that. We were hoping that uh, by not moving firewood around, we might avoid that, but uh, it didn't work out quite as well as we'd hoped. So those quarantines have been lifted. Uh, however, it is still a good idea to uh, get your firewood and burn it locally rather than transporting it around because the emerald ash borer was one example, but there's many insects like that that travel with firewood that... Uh, can cause problems. They may not be able to move like the Emerald Ash Borer did without people transporting firewood. So it's one of those things that you got to be kind of cautious of. Yeah, I know when I got my okay. hunting license for the state of Iowa, they have a little note in there that you're not allowed to bring firewood that direction. So Yeah, I wouldn't even have thought about that. You'd almost think that geez, how could we, you know, by taking firewood from place to place cause some damage, but it's amazing just like you said, what insects will just hang on to that and then get deposited in somewhere else. So that's, that's, um, yeah, that can be a problem. And typically if you completely burn all the firewood that you bring with you, it doesn't cause a problem. But if you leave some behind that leaves that opportunity for whatever eggs may have been with that firewood to hatch out right. and, and start a new colony in that area. So. Yeah. Now, now, how you had mentioned earlier about shelters for uh, people to uh, get together, I guess, or to rent. How? Let's just for an example, at state park since it's it's such a big park. How many shelters uh, do you guys have out there available? Uh, we have two shelters at Salt Fork that are available. Both are in the beach area. Uh, okay. I believe the charge for those is forty five dollars for a day's use. Uh, they have electric with them. There's water nearby. So you've got some amenities there. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the parks have some sort of a shelter. Uh, up in the horse camp, the uh, horsemen got together and put a couple shelters in there that they use strictly for use in the horse camp and for the horsemen that are there. So as a result, there's no charge for those. But uh, as I say, they put those in uh, themselves, paid for them themselves. So that was a that was a good gift that they gave to us, and it certainly improved the quality of camping at uh, in our horse camp. Yeah, uh, talking about um, horse camp, uh, Salt Fork, I know, has horseback riding trails. Is there any other um, state parks that have horseback riding trails? There are many state parks that uh, have horseback riding trails. Most of them have the same stipulation that Salt Fork does in that you have to bring your own horse. We don't have the stables here to 
rent horses. Mm. Uh, but just in the East Central District, uh, Dillon has some horseback trails. Uh, Salt Fork is a leader typically in the state uh, for most miles of trail ridden, and we, we get up to 100,000 miles of trail ridden a year from the reports that we get. Wow. And uh, we've got a total of, I think, 93 miles of, of equestrian trail now, so that's Jeez. a pretty big number. But it is. Again, with the largest state park, it's we've got the room to do that. Uh, and Bar Camp also has uh, has some horseback trails over there. So wow. East Central Ohio has got quite a few, actually. Hmm. Well, well, guys, another reminder that today's program, uh, our visit with Hal Harper here from from the East Central uh, District Manager for the Ohio State Parks, is brought to you by. Self-Reliance Illustrated. You can check out the magazine at selfrelianceillustrated.com. It's available in e-copy and in print copy. Check out their Facebook page and join in on the forums where you get to talk about a lot of different things, anything outdoors from horseback riding to primitive skills, camping, and even some homesteading ideas. So remember that at Self-Reliance Illustrated, and that is at selfrelianceillustrated.com. Well, how we were talking a little bit about the the horseback riding trails, Salt Fork. Um, actually, some of the guys that work for Dan and I do hike the trails out there. You, you got a pretty nice setup for hiking. Is do they kind of run hand in hand with the horse trails? Well, yes. In some areas, we do get uh, some crossover. Uh, typically, the trails are designated one way or the other, either for hiking or for horseback. Oh, okay. But uh, there is some crossover. And the the biggest thing is for folks uh, that are on, on a horseback trail that uh, without a horse, if you see a horse coming, the uh, best thing is just step aside of the trail and, and kind of stand still and let them pass by. Because some horses get a little spooky if, mm-hmm. if there's uh, some motion right around them. So uh, hikers and horseback riders, we typically don't have any issues with them. Okay. Uh, we try to keep uh, mountain bike trails and horseback trails completely separate because the, there can be some user conflict in that case. Mm. Well, I noticed when when we were talking earlier about just all the the available areas around the Cambridge area, uh, how many acres in Ohio are state parks? You know, I really can't tell you what the total acreage is. Uh, as I said before, there's 77 state parks in Ohio, mm-hmm. and they'll range anywhere from oh, a two or 300 acre park up to Salt Fork, which is slightly over 20,000. So wow. there's a great variety there. And uh, again, some of these parks border national forests, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, down at Hocking Hills and those areas that uh, you can kind of combine the two together. So there's a lot of acreage out there for recreational use for for people that are looking to do that outside. So there really isn't any excuse for the guys to get out there. You guys have provided uh, plenty of areas for the, the hikers and the campers, hunters, and even the fishermen. Yes, and, and uh, like I said, we've got a huge variety of, of opportunities to do uh, just about anything outdoors that you'd want to do. Mm-hmm. So, Hal, can you tell me how many lakes are there in the state park system? Uh... I can't give you that number off the top of my head either, but I can tell you that almost all of the state parks have some kind of a lake in them, whether it's uh, uh, maybe a 15-acre lake like we see over in Jefferson County at uh, Jefferson State Park or uh, the bigger ones like Grand Lake St. Mary's, which uh, I think is somewhere around 3,000 acres. So, uh, you know, it, like I said, it's out there. If, if you're looking for something to do, there's, well, there's a lot of there's opportunity of for somebody to get a boat out there on the lake. Yes, there is. And um, is, Do you have any lakes that uh, you are not allowed to have motorized boats on? Yes, and, and it varies. Uh, you, can have, you can experience anything from a lake that is uh, absolutely no motor. Uh, we've got some that electric motor only some in that range where they've got a 10 horsepower limit on them and then several lakes with unlimited horsepower. Well, that's cool. So there really is no excuse. Whatever you got, you can find a place to use it. Yep. Sounds like it. 
Well, um, I, now that we have a, about a lake in every park, what kind of fish, if you were a fisherman, that would you uh, have an opportunity to encounter in these lakes? You know, I think uh, pretty much any fish that's native to Ohio, whether they, whether you're looking for uh, walleye or bass or just maybe hoping to catch a few bluegill or some crappie. I know uh, we've got several lakes that are becoming well-known for their muskie, uh, which is becoming a, a very popular game fish. And uh, they do trout stack, stocking at several lakes in the East Central District. Uh, Bar Camp and Wolf Run are both going to be part of that stocking program again this year. Uh, and I think... Between all the lakes that they stock, there's going to be somewhere around 96,000 uh, trout stocked, and they're all in the range of 10 to 13 inches. So that's a pretty good opportunity nice. for someone to catch a trout if uh, if that's what they're Yeah, that's pretty for. good. That's the kind of fish that I grew up uh, catching, so that really interests me. I didn't even know we had trout here that we could fish. Yeah, and the Division of Wildlife does a nice job uh, in conjunction with parks and making sure that our lakes get stocked that way. Uh, we've got a good partnership with them, so it works out well, well for both of us. Well, that's an attaboy to them for uh, getting that program out there. Um, is there any state parks out there that would allow off-road vehicles or four-wheelers? At this point in time, we do not have any parks, uh, state parks that allow that. I know that there's a couple of parks that were investigating that possibility in developing some four-wheeler trails, but at this point, there, there aren't any out there that we offer that. Hey, guys. Today's program is brought to you by Self-Reliance Illustrated. You can check it out at selfrelianceillustrated.com. They got e-online versions that get sent right to your email and print copies available. It's a good publication that covers fire, water, shelter, all the things you need outdoors. So that's Self-Reliance Illustrated, teaching our youth and passing on the tribal knowledge. Check it out at selfrelianceillustrated.com. Okay. Okay. Hey, how uh, roughly, would you have any idea how many jobs are created by the state park system? Oh, my. <laughs> uh, I don't know, quite frankly. Okay. I think... Uh, when you consider all the seasonal jobs that we put in uh, in the summertime, I, I can't even hazard a guess, to be honest with you. I would say that in the East Central District, we're going to be somewhere around 350 folks that are going to be employed by state parks for you know at least part of the year. Some of those are full-time jobs, but uh, That's, uh... mostly it's seasonal things. That's great. So I guess if they want a, information about a possible job, again, going to OhioStatePark.org, is that how they would find out about it? Uh, yeah, and if you uh, if you want to go online, and, and I can't recall that website right at the moment, but there is the possibility to go online and see what is available out there. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's Ohio.gov. That uh, okay. will provide you a link to that. That uh, you can see what's what's available in, uh, in not just state parks, but all of ODNR. Okay. Well, how we would like to thank you today for being a part of the show, and hope to have you back at another date. So, guys, um, please join us every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. on ESPN Cambridge. For the very latest, be sure to like our BHK Outdoors Facebook page or you can follow us on Twitter. If you'd like to ask Dan and I a question or if you have a show idea, please email us at radio at bhkoutdoors.com. And thank you all for being with us and remember to join us right here next Saturday for BHK Outdoors, your beacon for all things outdoors. Until then, I'm LT. I'm Dan. And may God bless all of you.